Um, okay, in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes, uh, I'd like to discuss about... Uh, <laughs> about the... Um, the fact that there are patients with ARDS who may really benefit from invasive mechanical ventilation, which is uh, not only a supportive therapy, but maybe a treatment. Um, so, as you know, the treatment of patients with uh, ARDS is really challenging, and I would say the most uh, difficult part is really the management of spontaneous breathing, whether it's before intubation or after intubation. Uh, the baby lung is, is uh, a nice explanation why mechanical ventilation has been so difficult. And as you probably uh, are all familiar, the, the reasoning is quite uh, simple. It's not, it's not that simple, but it could be explained simply, saying, uh, um, the, the lung in ARDS is, is made of a gasless compartment which is not ventilated and one uh, aerated compartment which is the baby lung and which is so small that it's very sensitive to uh, injury. And uh, in passive mechanical ventilation, it was shown that if you look at the distending pressure of the lung, so the, the driving pressure, uh, this is the best prognostic indicator of uh, the risk of death under mechanical ventilation, so probably the risk of ventilation, ventilator-induced lung injury. So the question is, uh, okay, so this small lung, uh, high distending pressure, this is risky. Could it happen also during spontaneous ventilation. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you think from a very theoretical physiology, you would say, well, if the distending pressure is the problem, yes, it could absolutely happen in the same way. So this is a schematic drawing where you have the flow, the airway pressure in black and the alveolar pressure in red, the esophageal pressure, and the difference between airway and esophageal, which is called the transpulmonary pressure, pressure for the lung, PL. And let's imagine that this is controlled ventilation. Let's imagine that the same patient is taking the same tidal volume with the same flow. Uh, the pressures will be very different because there, there will be no positive pressure at the mouth. But to get the same flow and the same volume, you need the same distending pressure. That's the basic physiology called the equation of motion of the respiratory system. So in fact, if you calculate or compute the transpulmonary pressure, it would be exactly the same. And you could make the same reasoning during partial assist where there could be a little bit of airway pressure ventilation, maybe less negative pressure swings in, in the thorax, but the difference between the two, the transpulmonary pressure, will be the same. So at least from a theoretical standpoint, the same distending pressure can be applied by spontaneous breathing compared to controlled ventilation. Uh, Giacomo Bellani uh, did a previous study where, uh, by chance, he get recordings of airway pressure, esophageal pressure, and transpulmonary pressure for the same patients, both during pressure support and during control ventilation. So he could check from this data whether this uh, theory saying you could have the same transpulmonary pressure for the same volume and flow, that could be the same during control ventilation or during partial ventilation. And he looked at uh, uh, different levels of pressure support. Uh, and of course, the, he compared the transpulmonary pressure during pressure support and during CMV. But of course, the volume are different, the flow are different. So he tried to keep the breath where, and this is this part of the slide, where the flow was approximately the same and the volume was approximately the same. And when you do that, <laughs> 
you see that you have exactly the same transpiratory pressure swings during controlled ventilation or during spontaneous breathing. And spontaneous breathing is different level of pressure support, so different uh, combination of pressure, airway pressure and spontaneous breathing. So at least uh, this is uh, this verify the, the basic physiology, so you could have a, exactly the same distending pressure. Uh, so if this is the major risk for injury, this could happen. In addition, there was an interesting observation, which is the fact that uh, if you go from control ventilation, and the two values are the, the mean value and the maximum value uh, for every uh, condition, to high level of support, low, medium level of support, low level of support, for the same PEEP on the ventilator, well, the alveolar pressure becomes more and more negative, which, which makes sense, of course, because the distribution of pressure are different. So you could have the same risk of distension plus less PEEP or more negative alveolar pressure, which is uh, potentially important because uh, there is one very well-known phenomenon, which is called negative pressure pulmonary edema. This was a nice uh, review um, uh, published in CHEST, uh, and uh, which has been described in uh, upper airway obstruction or uh, uh, clinical situation where patients make huge efforts uh, and, and uh, creating pulmonary edema. So this is mostly hydrostatic pulmonary edema, but you could well imagine in a situation where there is lung injury, on top of that, you could add some negative pulmonary edema, uh, worsening the, the total edema in the lung. So um, this possibility of uh, worsening pulmonary edema with spontaneous ventilation has been very well demonstrated now in animals. This is a study from uh, Takeshi Yoshida, who is now working in, in Toronto, where he had the same ventilation settings. This is passive ventilation, and you recognize the positive swings in esophageal pressure. And this is negative swings because the, the animals now are breathing spontaneously. And he showed, interestingly, that uh, depending on the severity of lung injury, addition of spontaneous breathing could really worsen the uh, situation. So, this is a mild lung injury, and you see that spontaneous breathing is beneficial. So it's, uh, it's uh, reopening some, some part of the lung, it better distributing ventilation. But when lung injury is already present and severe, spontaneous ventilation clearly worsens the situation. In addition, and this uh, makes things even more complicated, um, I told you from the beginning about the baby lung. With, with the open part and the non aerated part. Well, in fact, if you locally generate negative pressure because you're using your respiratory muscle, you may reopen this part. The baby lung is a functional lung. We know that from the studies in prone position. If we move the patient in the other side, the part which was non aerated is now aerated. So locally, when the diaphragm is active, it may open and presumably open and close, open and close the non-dependent part of the lung. And this may create local injury because this may be, sorry, this may be associated with uh, what uh, they, they describe as a pendeluft, which is an internal redistribution of volume. So locally, the activity, the contraction of the diaphragm could generate another, by another mechanism, uh, injury in the normally non aerated lung, but which may become aerated under spontaneous breathing. So do we know whether spontaneous breathing by itself may generate lung injury? The answer is yes, very, very clear. So, this is a beautiful study by uh, a group of uh, Koloboff in 1988. This is the kind of studies we have in medicine, which, uh, which, which stay somewhere for decades. 
you know, like the web entire on a paper, like uh, nobody takes care. And then uh, 20 years later, people say, well, that was a very important study. And this was a study in animals where um, hyperventilation was induced pharmacologically by inducing uh, um, salicylate acid in, directly in the brain. So because of the central acidosis, the animals were hyperventilating. And they compared these animals, so you see the increase in minute ventilation, to control group, and in fact to two control group. One where the animals were simply paralyzed, but were kept acidotic, so to be sure it's not the effect of the acidosis, and the other animals where they were ventilated with acidosis corrected. And in the spontaneously breathing animals, you see that there was a progressive drop in oxygenation, and histology show findings very similar to what we, it was called later ventilation-induced lung injury. So yes, definitely V, it's possible to just by hyperventilation uh, induce uh, lung injury. And I've shown that before, but uh, we, we have very few data in non-intubated patients about uh, how much volume they take. And so in this study, we measure tidal volume in patients under NIV for hypoxemic respiratory failure. And uh, NIV was titrated by the nurses based on an, a target of tidal volume. And the target was, please adjust the pressure support and PEEP so that the tidal volume is between 6 and 8. And look at that. Only 20% of the patients had a tidal volume really between 6 and 8. Was it because uh, nurses were crazy? No, it's because it's impossible to control the tidal volume because, th because of the respiratory drive of the patient. So this is very important information. And for instance, when we speak about the side effects of uh, non-invasive ventilation increasing tidal volume, I, I don't think it's, it's non-invasive ventilation. It's a patient. Their drive is crazy. And you can't control tidal volume. And we found that uh, patients who were uh, especially the patient with moderate or severe hypoxemia, so that would be PF below 200. The patients who failed an IV had a much higher tidal volume. You see, this is huge. This is 10, 11, 12 ml. We are really in the zones of the uh, ARDS network study comparing 6 to 12. So they are developing tidal volume, which we know under mechanical ventilation create lung injury. And we found this uh, interesting... Uh, Threshold of 9.5 milliliter per kilogram predicted a very high likelihood of failure. And as I mentioned previously, uh, the postdoc analysis of the Florali study in the NIV arm gave exactly the same value. It was around 9 something predicting failure. So uh, I think that uh, we have patients who do develop uh, uh, hyperventilation, and this is because they have an initial lung injury. This creates capillary leaks uh, in general in the lung. This induces lung edema in the interstitium, in the alveoli. This, of course, worsen gas exchange, worsen mechanics, so two reasons for the drive to be increased. And the increase in drive increased the swings in esophageal pressure, increased transpulmonary pressure and tidal volume, may generate this pendeluft uh, effect, uh, decreased alveolar pressure, and uh, we think the patient, uh, we call that self-inflicted lung injury. So we think this is not silly, this is silly. Uh, and, and I'm sure the, our chairman will be uh, in agreement with me today on that. Uh, so we, there are situations where the patients put themselves at risk. And the best technique we know today to protect the lung is to deliver lung protective ventilation, and, uh, which means sedation, intubation, paralysis, and a very strict control of tidal volume. 
So, in fact, the, this is all I have to say, unfortunately, because I, I cannot tell you which patients exactly, when to do it, when to decide, but I think we should be aware that this is uh, likely. The data suggests that the, when the tidal volume under non-invasive ventilation or maybe spontaneously is, is close to nine or above nine, the patient at, at very high risk. Um, we, we discussed before that maybe there, there could be technique protective against that, like, like high flow therapy, like, uh, like CO2 removal to control the drive, but I think it's too experimental today to propose it uh, instead of intubation. And I, I do think, therefore, that uh, mechanical ventilation is not only uh, a support uh, with, with a lot of complication. This is also a treatment. And there are patients where we need to apply this treatment. And I think if we were more convinced about that, we would probably better ventilate our patients also in the ICU, not only at the time of intubation, but, but recognize that lung protective ventilation is really a therapy. Thank you very much. <laughs>